So hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the Explorers Club and this morning in our kind of unusual time of 11am which is because Samantha is actually in Korea at the moment um, we are joined by Samantha Treasure who is a medical anthropology researcher and we're going to be talking about sleep paralysis the phenomenon of sleep paralysis Samantha's personal experiences of it the the kind of science and psychology of it and the cultural and anthropological implications of it as well so Samantha thank you very much for joining us this morning how are you yeah I'm very good thank you um thanks for having me as you can see it's evening here so I think probably on both sides we're still kind of like either winding down for sleep or waking up so kind of a good time to talk about strange sleep phenomena like sleep paralysis yeah, what made you interested in sleep paralysis in the first place? Is it your personal experiences of it and the fact that there wasn't um, that much research or information about it? Strangely, no. So I have had sleep paralysis. Um, I probably first had sleep paralysis about 15 years ago and I've had about maybe a dozen or so experiences, but they didn't, they were more kind of amusing to me. Um, and my younger brother had um, the worst sleep paralysis I've ever heard of in my entire life, like in terms of being really scary. Um, but he kind of saw it as a funny, like funny story to tell his friends. So we kind of, um, even though it was scary, I think we tried to see humor in it some, in some way. Um, but it wasn't until um, about 10 years ago, um, I was getting really into lucid dreaming. And when I tried to train myself to lucid dream, I started to have out-of-body experiences, like uncontrollably almost every night. And it really creeped me out. I kind of, most of the time I shook myself out of it, just like most people shake themselves out of sleep paralysis. Um, that had much more of an impact on me. So I ended up actually quitting uni in my final year, um, taking a few years to think about it and then realizing that I wanted to um, study anthropology, study the anthropology of out-of-body experiences. So I knew that to do that, I would need to learn about sleep and dreams in general, and um, also sleep paralysis, because a lot of people that have one experience have the other, and sometimes you can have um, like a sleep paralysis episode, and then from there go into an OBE, or vice versa. So it's definitely connected. There's a lot of similarities as well, um, which we can talk about too. Um, so, so basically while I was like, okay, I need to get more of a holistic view of sleep and dream. Um, I did a small university project on sleep paralysis, um, just to get it out of the way. I was like, I'm going to spend a couple months learning everything I can about sleep paralysis to get it out of the way. So I did a, a digital mini ethnography of how people talk about sleep paralysis on Reddit and Facebook. So I kind of looked at like the most recent 50 posts on both platforms and the kind of themes that come up. And one of the things that people talked about a lot was that people don't understand them when they talk about sleep paralysis. Like they might laugh at them or think that they're crazy or whatever. And even talking to their um, doctor, sometimes they would be laughed at or the doctor wouldn't know anything about it. Um, but um, yeah, we were just yeah. saying when we were chatting earlier about like doctors unless a doctor specializes in sleep medicine they generally don't have training with regard to sleep paralysis or anything yeah. like that. and we were talking about the um the fact that sleep apnea is often related to sleep paralysis episodes as well and that doesn't really get talked about much on the kind of new age spiritual platforms that discuss sleep paralysis i've noticed but it's often interlinked with the people that i speak to there'll be an obstructive apnea dimension to that condition yeah exactly um so that's a real problem because so that's what david hufford an anthropologist who specializes in sleep paralysis um he talks about that um the fact that doctors don't talk about it um, and they're like the first port of call for people generally um leaves people vulnerable to um like cults or gurus or you know I don't know, like kind of new, new age gurus and stuff. Are there, and, are there places where sleep paralysis is taken a bit more seriously? Like you were saying, a lot of people suffer from sleep paralysis where in Korea, where you are now, because of the level of sleep um, Yeah, I think so. Um, 
because people generally um, don't sleep very well. So I've been speaking to somebody about sleep paralysis here who experienced it a lot. She used to be cabin crew. And she said a lot of people have insomnia or sleep paralysis here, but um, normally if they tell someone, they're like, don't go to a doctor because you'll get a medical record and you won't be able to get a job in the future. And there's just this like huge stigma about mental health here. Um, and there haven't been that many studies on sleep paralysis here, but it does seem to be quite prevalent here and in Japan where there, there is a lot of sleep deprivation. Mm. So um, we were talking as well about whether or not uh, sleep paralysis can be like an inherited trait and have a genetic um, element to it. Like you were saying, your brother has sleep paralysis, you experience sleep paralysis. Yeah. yeah, so there was, I think there have been now a couple studies done on genetics, um, but there was like a variation of PER2 gene which was shown to have a link with sleep paralysis. I think there was a study of twins in England and Wales and they found like about 50% of them um, had sleep paralysis connected to this gene, which has to do with the circadian rhythm. But they also found that they, a lot of them also had uh, stressful situations recently or sleep, sleep deprivation. Mm -hmm. So a lot, like the question is kind of, um, there's a lot of things that can stress people out or make them anxious and a lot of things that can disrupt our sleep and those things can cause or exacerbate sleep paralysis in people. Mm. So we were talking before we went live about uh, PTSD and trauma and anxiety being linked in with sleep paralysis as well and you were saying that you visited some people in refugee camps. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so initially so I ended up doing my dissertation on um, encounters with uh, people or entities and out-of-body experiences um, and and then from that I kind of learned that there were a lot of similarities with sleep paralysis but initially I was going to do my dissertation on um, refugees and their sleep and dream disturbances because I read in a book um, it kind of just in passing said that refugees tend to have more sleep paralysis or more sleep disturbances and um, so a friend of mine was a recent graduate and had been working for an NGO in these camps in Hamburg. They're not really so much camps, they're more like, you know, houses that have just re recently been built just outside of the city. Um, so, and then he kind of went with me and translated into Arabic for me and we spoke to probably about 10 people and um, I think about half of them had had either like sleep paralysis or nightmares or some sort of night terror. So. One of the people there um, had actually been put in the same room as somebody from a different country. They didn't speak the same language and that guy was actually a heroin addict. So this is where like the kind of socio-political um, things come in because, I mean, a lot of people there, they're like asylum seekers. They don't have refugee status yet. So they're anxious already. Mm. And they've been through a lot in the past anyway. And, um, and like you say, and now they're housed. They're housed with, like you say, if they're housed with people yeah. that are potentially from uh, countries that they themselves are in conflict with, that would exactly, really exactly. So the thing that we heard the most, even more than talking about their dreams, people just wanted to tell us about this, and they would say things like, "Oh, you know, this ethnicity don't, you know, don't trust them because they'll smile to your face, but they'll say things behind your back." And you talk to somebody from that ethnicity and they would say the same thing about them. And there was like a real kind of anxiety around them. Um, but one, so the person who was housed with the heroin addict, um, the guy, while we were there, the guy had actually gotten arrested. So he was alone, but um, he was going to like art therapy and he didn't feel comfortable. Like he wanted to paint his nightmares, but he didn't feel comfortable doing that in front of people. Mm. So he would actually steal the supplies and then paint his nightmares at home. Mm. So he showed us some of these paintings and they were um, like, you know, being in, eaten by alligators or having a gun held to you and these kinds of things. Um, and then so where you find these kind of epidemics of sleep paralysis, um, it does seem to happen in populations that are like recent refugees or people that are going through a revolution or something like that as well. Mm. And I think now like with I mean, I'd be interesting to hear from people who have um, 
sleep paralysis to see if it's gotten worse during the lockdown or better because some people have had a better night's sleep since lockdown but other people are like stressed out so it could exacerbate it you wrote about uh corona dreams because i was very interested in corona dreams as well and i think that for a lot of people especially at the beginning there seemed to be this um i got contacted by a lot of reporters from the bbc to talk about dreams because people were suddenly noticing their dreams for the first time in ages and they needed yeah. to have specific themes and i think in the beginning um my with my research like most of the dreams about corona in the beginning involved uh basically giving form to the fear so people were having a lot of dreams about crawling with insects and stuff like that because corona was an invisible yeah, they, were, they were giving it a form in their dreams and then one of the hilarious things i noticed was that people were also watching tiger king so a lot of their dreams were about big cats being the threat because tiger king and corona oh, that's black. funny that actually um that actually explains something because uh, the Tavistock Institute have been hosting social dream matrix events. And I think they've been doing this for years, but um, they've been doing like special lockdown ones. So what it is is where there's a circle of somebody will share their dream, and then the next person will share a dream that has a similar theme and so on. Mm-hmm. And then over the course of the hour, you start to kind of notice like a similar threads running through it and that it hints at people's kind of worries or what's on their mind. And um, one of the things that came out a lot, so there were kind of two main things that came out. One was not being able to go somewhere, like mm. being refused entry to a building because you didn't have your papers or enough money or something like that. Yeah. And the other one was um, like marriage or partnerships, so being having nightmares of being stuck with an ex or getting married to a total stranger but feeling actually safer that you're with someone. Mm. And somebody actually said they jumped at two tigers getting married too. So maybe they'd seen Tiger King. Yeah. And that all kind of got mixed in with that. Yeah. I mean I but think they, that um people were sleeping longer during the initial phase of lockdown. And I think that especially with regards to lucidity, you tend to have lucid episodes within the last like 90 minutes of waking up. So I think because yeah having that extra sleep experience and they had particular anxieties those were manifested in uh, like unusually rememberable dreams for people which was because I was when people were contacting me they were telling me I have this really weird dream and I don't know what it means and I was just like wow you must never dream because (laughs) it's really a standard anxiety you know standard anxiety dreams so but you you've always had this dream I don't, I don't have so what, do necessarily every day, but I've always mm-hmm. been really familiar with my dreaming landscape. And I do also mm-hmm. feel that when I dream about things, I tend to know what it refers to or what it references. Like I don't normally watch films. And last night me and my daughter watched The Hustle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and my dreams last night were like all basically like reconfigurations of that plot line. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, I re- I sort of really notice how much watching films because I don't do it very often affects dream content. And I was saying to you before, actually, it amazes me in my dream workshops how many people are massive horror film fans but don't make yeah. the connection between their nightmares and horror movies. So have you done much yeah. about um, that kind of culture? Sorry. Have you learned much about the kind of culture of horror movie watching or scary film? Um, Mainly mainly from personal experience because I was, um, so the past couple of years I've had like lucid dream dry spell and OBE dry spell. I only have them every now and then. But before that I was having them like maybe once a week or something. And then all of a sudden, I don't know why, but I switched from like REM lucid dreams in the last 90 minutes of sleep to non-REM dreams in the first half an hour or so of sleep. I don't know why, it lasted a couple of weeks and then it went away. Actually, all my lucid dreams kind of went away from then. But I noticed I was binge watching a zombie series on Netflix. And then when I became lucid in my like non-REM sleep, it was different. It was like, I was kind of in the background watching my mind um, reconfigure my model of self and my environment and how i'm going to it was like i it was almost like my brain didn't know the difference between me and the protagonist and so that really shocked me i was like wow okay movies and tv and everything 
I don't think our, we're not evolved to be watching things on screens like that and watching so much fiction, right? I don't think our brain really knows the difference. So no, I think that's true. What is that doing to us? Yeah, one of the um, I listened to a really interesting radio documentary once, which was about the the invention of the steam train. And one of the things I remember from that time were well, this account of two women that fainted because they were so overwhelmed by the speed of the steam train. And you kind of think our mm. life is now like way beyond steam train technology. Yeah. And so I'm not sure whether we can really cope. And I think that uh, a lot of anxiety, mm. depression and other mental health issues are caused by this like extreme overstimulation. Yes, exactly. And speaking of which, I'm just going to turn the heat off because... Um, <laughs> Oh, that was one thing I was going to ask you about, actually, is temperature. Temperature yeah. and um, um, like physical aspects that may encourage sleep paralysis. Because I know yeah. that um, if I get hot, I, I tend know. to have nightmares. And I am yeah. hugely against exactly. memory foam mattresses for that reason. I think memory foam mattresses are a, a modern evil. Hmm, yeah, probably. Um, yeah, that's a that's thing. Actually, in Korea, like for hundreds of years, their heating is um, this kind of central underfloor heating, which is really cool. But um, it really heats up the house. Like my feet are burning right now. Um, but yeah, I've been so I've been actually sleeping like on the floor the past few nights, and I have been having some kind of funky dreams. So I have to come and like turn the the heat off at night. But yeah, that's one thing a lot of people say is if you get sleep paralysis, like make sure that you um, sleep with a lighter blanket on you or make sure that you don't have um, the heat on at night or open a window or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, because heat can definitely kind of make you feel more oppressed. And uh, same with like, yeah, heavy blankets or bulky pajamas or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, I luckily don't have any heating in my house, so that is not a problem for me. I've got the oh, window. I, really the rat I, like, I like being able to see my breath at night when I get into bed. I like to have a nice warm bed, but um, I never have heating on in my bedroom. Is that because you're afraid of the sleep paralysis? I don't have just... any heating mm -hmm. either. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> But I think, I think sound also has a big impact and the sound environment for modern mm -hmm. humans is super different to um, the way it would have been for our ancestors. And I'm yeah. always amazed sometimes because I'm so extremely particular about my sleep environment and sleep hygiene. I'm often really astonished at what people, what kind of conditions people sleep in with various electronic devices going on in the background or falling asleep watching films is a big one as well. I can never do that. And people do that a lot. Mm -hmm. And especially, well, most films have some sort of traumatic, horrible, violent content, even if they're relatively, in, you know, innocent. I was watching, mm -hmm. I was watching like my daughter's really into Marvel films and the torture mm. scenes and like the amount of horror in what is supposed to be like a kid's film these days is insane. Oh. Um, and uh, you know, people, I've, I've never been able to fall asleep like in a car or uh, watching films or anything, but a lot of people do these days fall asleep with their laptop open, with their phone next to them, mm. with some sort of light on in their bedroom. And I think all mm. of those things tend to affect sleep quality. Yep it can make you sort of sleep deprived. So you might think that you're having a good night's sleep um, until you actually do have a good night's sleep and then you're like, wow. Um, so I've been using um, like noise, noise canceling headphones recently. And that's amazing, like that's such a game changer and they're really expensive, but they're probably worth it. Before, um, when I was in London, I was using a, a white noise machine just to block out the sounds of the traffic. And that was really good too. I think those are only like, you can get that those for about 20 quid. Mm. Yeah, I, um, use, ear, I use earplugs whenever, whenever I'm somewhere that's a little bit noisy. But the thing with earplugs is you can then hear the blood in your head and that has another oh, yeah. um, kind of knock and on. And it's not good for your ears too. You can get um, yeah. ear infections from using them as well. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask about like medication and self-medicating as well. Things like alcohol and uh, cannabis and things like mm. antidepressants and sleeping tablets, like sleeping tablets, ironically 
generally deteriorate your quality of sleep, even though you might feel like you're getting more sleep sometimes? Yeah, some antidepressants can um, yeah. actually, oh, yeah, yeah, suppress REM sleep, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't really want to speak too much about specific medications because I don't, I mean, a lot of people have told me about different types of medication, the effect that it's had. Um, but I haven't really looked into it too much or been asking like, doctors about it or anything like that. But um, a lot of people do self-medicate with alcohol or cannabis. And again, like that suppresses REM, so that's kind of a no-no. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, this is the thing, like we've got so many coping mechanisms um, across cultures that are actually doing more harm than good. Mm -hmm. But it's just like a quick fix. It's something to distract us. And I think one reason why a lot of people sleep with, um, you know, the TV on or something is to feel like there's somebody in the room with them. Yeah. Because again, like I said, I don't think our brain really knows the difference between like somebody real and somebody on screen. Oh, that was or even oftentimes me and like you gonna, or somebody else. I was going to say actually, because I, I hugely prefer sleeping on my own and I have a much better quality yeah. of sleep than sleeping on my own. And I like quiet and I like darkness and I like having yeah. the kind of, I get a feeling of um, uh, symmetry and mm -hmm. harmony if I sleep on my own whereas if I sleep with somebody else I feel mm -hmm. their presence and it affects yeah, them. it's like a sense of boundedness yeah I'm up for like separate yeah. bedrooms and all that kind of business I think it's yeah. really important. like if you want to have sex do yeah. it somewhere else and then go back go back into your bedroom to go to sleep yeah 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 I think it depends I think a lot of people um like some people that get sleep paralysis uh say that they think it's because when they were kids they didn't feel exactly too safe sleeping. Like maybe they didn't have a very big family or they lived in a, an unsafe neighborhood or something. So it's like you learn to sleep, you learn to have more light sleep because a part of you is trained to be on guard. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, so something like having the TV on or, or maybe having a pet or if you don't have a loved one, um, you know, can help but then again like having that blue light from the tv or the screen is is going to disrupt your sleep so you have to choose um healthy coping mechanisms mm -hmm. but that reminds me though so i've actually heard a few people say that um their pets have kind of intuitively learned when to wake them up when they have sleep paralysis oh that's so cute <laughs> it's so cute yeah and it's so interesting like they they can tell when the breathing is changing or when they, you know, they're like struggling or something. Um, and you can also kind of, so a lot of people, they try to move violently and they try to fight against the feeling of sleep paralysis. That'll probably make it worse because it works you up. So um, the best thing to do is try to stay calm and just tell yourself that it's not real. And I mean, I'm not going to try and explain it away with, science or with anything because i don't know like nobody really knows what it is if it's something spiritual or not but i do know there's a lot of evidence that um believing that it's real can actually uh lead to more medical problems mm. like more heart problems and things like that yeah um and then in the moment like sometimes when i get sleep paralysis uh it's really hard to believe that whatever's in my room is not real in some way yeah. because it's so convincing but yeah. if sometimes if you know about like some kind of theory to explain it, you can just try to convince yourself in that moment, even if you don't 100% believe it, it can kind of try, like it calm you down. It's so a really, one theory. Yeah, good yeah, one, power of belief from placebo. To, yeah, totally, the placebo effect. Um, uh, so yeah, one theory is that um, during sleep paralysis, our serotonin and dopamine levels are lower because they kind of go up and down throughout the night. And that's why we have kind of negative emotions and we see scary things. Um, so that's one thing to maybe just tell yourself when you have sleep paralysis. Do you know like about, um, the effectiveness of something like 5-HTP for um, sleep paralysis? Um, for sleep paralysis, I don't know. I have heard people uh, that have tried like melatonin and um, have like been prescribed it and that helped. Um, when I, I had, um, a large bout of insomnia last year 
and I was told by my GP not to take anything, so not 5-HTP, not anything. And um, I was reading the book, uh, Why We Sleep, which is like a great book to read. Um, and that also says like, it's just better not to take anything. Just don't touch your sleep cycle because your body is smart. Um, so just listen to your body, like just practice good sleep hygiene. Mm. And, and if something's stressing you out, find out what it is. And, you know, so for me, it, it was, um, you know, I had insomnia and I think my sleep paralysis was due to um, stress as well or being in a place that I wasn't really used to. Mm. Um, but it's also really important for people that have sleep paralysis to, to see their doctor just to rule anything out because there could be a lot of medical conditions underneath it as well. Yeah, I think uh, sleep apnea is the most important thing to rule out initially as far as I'm concerned. I would always mm. point someone in that direction initially. Um, one yeah. of the one of the areas of research that I find really interesting, I was talking to Anthony about this actually the other day, was a, I've got a person that I've been in contact with in California called Daniel Oldis, who's doing this research on recording dream speech. And um, mm. I had an experience because I've been obviously like, because my research is in all in the area of dream culture. I've like read everything I can and I've learned a lot of stuff about dream culture. But this paper that Daniel Aldis uh, published was about trying to record dream speech and the fact that the voice box, although when you go to sleep, your body is kind of like disabled so that you can't move and act out your dreams. There are areas yeah. of your body that can still move a little bit. And one of those is the voice box mm. makes the same micro movements as if it was speaking in um, real life. And so Daniel's doing this study to see whether or not he can um, uh, use electromyography to record those micro movements of the voice box to work out what you're saying in your dream. And it was one of those unusual, um, unusual bits of information that really I was just like, wow, that is amazing. That really, like, really kind of blew my mind. And so that mm -hmm. night when I went to sleep, I thought I'd like try it out and I became lucid and I was standing in Times Square in New York and I was um, really excited and really lucid and I remembered about the voice box movement so I was screaming and shouting really loudly this is amazing yeah. and then I could feel my voice box like making these tiny little micro movements and I had this realization that that is the explanation of why when you have a scary dream and you scream you feel like you're putting mm. loads and loads of energy into your scream but only a little like comes out because your voice box is just yeah, a yeah. scream rather than a massive proper scream i wonder if that's the same case with obes too and yeah and sleep paralysis because i've had some obes and out of body experiences where i try to speak but i can't mm. um, and a lot of people say you that like when your, they... your body does feel like you're making the effort to speak but it feels like a very tiny um result like no matter how much energy you put into the screen yeah or exactly or, or like even nothing at all yeah. yeah when i talk to people about sleep paralysis in my workshops they say that their method of getting out of sleep paralysis is screaming and i'm like that is an awful <laughs> way to try and get out of sleep paralysis <laughs> like, i think one of the uh, ways i try to do it is um doing micro movements of your fingertips because you can actually make like tiny yeah. tiny in your fingertips yeah. if you try to do the slow physical coming out of sleep paralysis i think yeah. actually uh tiny tiny movements and sensations are hugely amplified by the dream state and so that's for example mm -hmm. like if you do get a little bit hot you may dream you're in a fire or an apocalypse because your your mm -hmm. body is actually like hugely amplifying tiny sensory inputs mm -hmm. yeah I should open this up for everyone else now. Lily just asked a question. Um, do you, what do you think about sleep meditations and affirmations? Do you think that they can negatively affect sleep or do you think they're useful? I haven't heard of anything negatively affecting sleep, but then maybe I've only heard people using it, using like positive ones. But yeah, I have heard people say that positive affirmations help them with sleep paralysis. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm basically right now, I'm in the kind of analysis stage of doing a sleep paralysis study with um, a Russian psychiatrist. So she sort of did, um, you know, the Russian sleep paralysis population. I looked at the UK side. So, so I can kind of say like from some of the things that people shared uh, there with 
how they get into sleep paralysis or how they prevent it in the future. Um, and from my own experiences and like other people I've spoken to, um, I can like share some of these things mm. with you guys. Um, so you said that um, moving like your finger or something, uh, and I, I've also heard so the toes um, or even just like one or just kind of clenching them all together. Um, also the tongue and the nose, like trying to scrunch the nose actually helps. Um, but yeah, as like positive affirmations, thinking happy thoughts. Um, if your eyes are open, if you're seeing things, close your eyes, think happy thoughts. Um, and then breathe, like do some deep breathing exercises. Um, you can also try and focus at looking at your hand, at look, looking at something that you see. Um, some people, again, like have bad coping mechanisms, like they just try to stay awake as long as they can, and that's not really going to be helpful. Friday, uh, the 13th type situation. Uh, yes, exactly, yeah, which was kind of based on a true story mm. with the, the Hmong refugees in America in the, the 70s, I think, 70s and the 80s, and so funnily enough, so they've recently found out there's something called the Brugada syndrome, which is quite prevalent in South, Southeast Asian people, which um, that leads to a higher prevalence of sleep apnea, which mm. leads to a higher prevalence of sleep paralysis. And like we were talking about placebo effect or the nocebo effect, which is like you believe something bad's gonna happen to you, it does. Um, that they were so scared of it because they believed that this is a real entity that their their heart would be like pounding and they would get really scary sleep paralysis or nightmares and they would try and stay awake and then they'd be so sleep deprived deep sleep deprived they would go back to sleep and then they would like die in their sleep and it happened to over a hundred wow. uh, mostly men one one woman Wow. So actually, that's an, before we hand over um, to everybody else, actually, I just wanted to mention, ask about that, because uh, you, you wrote about that in the little write up for the talk about yeah. kind of cultural stories and mythologies based upon the sleep ex paralysis experience. Yeah, and, and kind the, of um, how, yeah. different cultures have different like demons that are associated with sleep paralysis experience. And it has different cultural or different names that kind of express it as well in other countries. Yeah, there's so in Zanzibar, um, there were a few epidemics of this popobawa, which means bat wing. Kind of sounds like a vampire, actually, because some people were saying that they saw like bats turn into men or vice versa. And it started during a revolution in the 60s and 70s. Um, and it was mostly like a sexual assault kind of thing. And then it sort of went away and it came back in 1995 for a couple of months. And a few people, so actually three people were killed because they believed that this, um, that they were actually, actually sorcerers that were conjuring these demons. And then in the 90s, it was um, attacking like men, women and children in many different ways and like choking them, pressing them. And so they actually ended up, um, because there was a psychiatric hospital on the island, um, some mentally ill people would come from the mainland to get treatment. And these were like strangers. They were acting a bit strange because they were mentally ill and they were targeted. And some of them were beaten and some of them were actually killed because they were believed to be Pokobawa. Um, and the government tried talking to the public through the TV and radio saying, it's not real, like stop <laughs> beating up people. And so people actually believed that the government was conspiring with these sorcerers to oppress the population with the Popabala. Um, so, and then I actually recently heard that there was another slight outbreak, out, out, outbreak in 2007, um, and somebody was killed again. And then after that death, like it didn't, nothing else happened. But so it's kind of, it's like a really twisted kind of placebo effect that, oh, we've killed the Popobawa, so it's not going to happen anymore. But then that kind of further, it makes them believe in that even more. So it's this kind of vicious uh, cycle. So yeah, it can have a huge effect. And it kind of reminds me of um, a friend I had in Canada when I was a teenager, uh, and his uncle was killed by a mob in Haiti because they believed that he was a werewolf. Wow. So I don't know like what, where that story came from and why they believe that but 
yeah, like these things can happen sometimes. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense to me that uh, early spiritual ideas were born in dreaming and sleeping. Like, I think yeah. I've written about um, the fact that I would imagine that a lot of dreams in which people had contact with the dead would inspire ideas of a life beyond death and an afterlife yeah. and mm -hmm. a reality in some way so i think that sleep paralysis i know that in egyptian dream culture sleep paralysis seems to have been a huge thing and i wonder even whether mm -hmm. um we've kind of potentially evolved our sleeping and dreaming experience and that sleep paralysis may have been more prevalent in the past especially in you know i mean you just have to look at an egyptian headrest to think that people probably weren't sleeping like eight hours solid or having the same kind of sleeping experience as we mm -hmm. the kind of pillows that they used to use yeah mm -hmm. okay do you know why they used to use those um there's sort of very, yeah there's very di there's different theories they, they would have been padded they did have pillows in ancient egypt because a big cache of pillows has been discovered so it wasn't like that no one would yeah. have pillows and I don't think everyone would have slept on those. And I think there are there are kind of like ceremonial ritual headrests that were probably never slept on and were just used for decorative purposes in the tomb to be kind of a symbolic representation of the headrest. And there's magic involved in them as well in terms of the afterlife because they were seen to protect the deceased person from being beheaded by demons in the afterlife. But um that's mm. your headrests like that are still used in some african countries to this day so they they did have a practical yeah. purpose as well but the, the thing, them, yeah, yeah the, the thinking is that they would have been padded and you would have slept on your side but i mean i think that oh, no matter how comfortable they are for a period they wouldn't be like sleeping in a modern okay. yeah i didn't know that they would sleep on their side but that's interesting a lot of i mean a lot in a lot of cultures as well i'm sure you know people do um like teach each other to sleep on their side and not on their backs mm. and sometimes tell the kids not to sleep on their backs and i think that probably is to um prevent, prevent sleep paralysis I, I but i did that, notice, um no go on i was just going to say i i find that sleeping on your back because i do a lot of um wake induced lucid dream practice and if i sleep on my yeah. back in the beginning it's a way of getting into a dream and maintaining your kind of conscious awareness of it because you're in that light mm -hmm. REM period um and a lot of people that sleep on their back all night will have sleep paralysis or out of body experiences and yeah, yeah. you're more likely as well because breathing is often more difficult if you're sleeping on your back mm. yeah that was something i wondered about because i heard that sleeping with a rolled up towel under your neck was good for you it's good for your posture and good for your your back or whatever but whenever I do that, um, I, yeah, more often than not, like I'll start to have out of body experiences or really just really, really vivid dreams. Mm -hmm. So I always wondered why, why, like, what is it about sleeping on your back? Um, but then, yeah, you do have like more light sleep when you're in that position. So any kind of light sleep can promote more sleep paralysis or OBs yeah. or, yeah. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions for Samantha? Because uh, it would be great if we could get some of your input on this and your questions or your experiences. Does anyone have sleep paralysis regularly? Um, I think you should all be able to unmute yourself. So please do unmute oh. yourself. Hello. <laughs> right. Hello. Hey. Um, first of all, thank you so much. It's been really, really interesting. Um, I have, I've had my camera off because I've been it was solstice last night, so I've just been scraping oh, candles off my <laughs> off my uh, desk. But um, yeah, I mean, I have sleep paralysis, um, but it's been recent because I've just started um, EDMR therapy, and oh. uh, and it's something. It's I mean, I used to have it as when I was partying a lot, um, <laughs> which mm, and yeah. I know a lot. Of a lot of friends, you know, will say that our casual class A drug users will will say that they a part a massive part of their come down is is sleep paralysis and it's it's terrifying. And actually for me, I'm probably revealing too much, but for me that was one of the reasons I stopped, you know, any any drug you know, any 
like you know ecstasy or anything that messed with my brain because I would get really terrifying you know sleep paralysis for weeks um where it was like Freddy Krueger <laughs> Freddy yeah. Krueger vibes where I just wouldn't wouldn't want to sleep um and I was just terrified of partying so which is probably a good thing but um <laughs> But it does tie yeah. in with the like dopamine and serotonin levels being depleted as well, doesn't it? Yeah, is, is that is that why that happens? Mm. And well, I think a lot of people. No, I think there's an element of sleep depression because I've not sleep depression, sleep deprivation because you've been up so much, and that. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's like a, a cocktail of issues, really. <laughs> and yeah. I think it's a lot of people will wonder why they have issues, and you know not realizing yeah. that but um but yeah recently i've started edmr therapy and um and it's quite new to me but i've noticed that i've been acting so it's my sleep paralysis has come back and i've been sort of processing mm -hmm. what i've been the, the trauma in in my therapy through through sleep paralysis um and sort of speaking to my therapist about it and she doesn't really know much about it so it's been quite quite difficult mm. what you said resonated you know in the beginning is that I you know doctors and and medical professionals don't always yeah. you know she's not really taking it seriously and it's um yeah, yeah. it's quite, quite difficult but. yeah it's it's interesting because most people when they go through like some sort of therapy or any any sort of anything um, where they need to process emotions they do that in nightmares normally mm. and i think there is a connection with nightmares and sleep paralysis um and my so my colleague on the russian study she did a study that showed that people who have sleep paralysis actually have less nightmares mm. but then she also kind of connected that to lucid dreams that it could be because they are also having lucid dreams and with lucid dreams you have less nightmares but there are all these, it's almost like, I think of it like roulette, a roulette table. Sometimes you, there's something going on in your life or you're trying a technique or you have a medical condition or there's all these different factors. And for some reason, like the ball lands on a certain experience like sleep paralysis or OBEs or whatever, like lucid REM dreams or lucid non-REM dreams. And it's, like I actually have um, an example of um, over the summer I was helping people with their sleep paralysis, like kind of doing detective work together and trying to figure out why they had the sleep paralysis. So there was one girl, um, she's actually, so she's in the Philippines and she got really into like Ouija boards and out of body experiences in high school. Mm -hmm. And she learned how to have OBEs out of curiosity, but then this triggered sleep paralysis. Just like with me, like my lucid dreams triggered OBE. So sometimes it just kind of happens and we don't know exactly why. But then we kind of worked out that the reason why she was getting sleep paralysis, she was only getting it in her house, but not at her friend's house. And she was like spending half her time at, at home and half the time in um, at her friend's house during the lockdown summer. And she only had sleep paralysis at her house. So we were like, okay, trying to work out like, is it the people that live in the building with you? Or do you have like, I don't know, do you feel safe throughout your friends and all this? And we narrowed it down and what it was, was that at her friend's house, she very rarely had coffee, but at her house, she had up to four cups of coffee mm -hmm. a day. And she did notice that the way we kind of got to that was that I was like, well, how do you feel when you have sleep paralysis? And she said, I get like really excited and I have heart palpitations and I said okay so why are you more excited at home and then we kind of got to that so a few weeks later she said okay I stopped I haven't had caffeine for a few weeks my sleep paralysis is gone but now I have nightmares so it's like constantly trying to unravel these things and okay so now I'm like asking her about lucid dreams or maybe learning how to have another kind of experience and transmute it into that um, but yeah, I, I think just try different techniques, uh, and see what works. So try, um, so I'll, I'll mention some of the things that people have done to prevent it happening in the future. Um, one of the things definitely would be to journal your sleep paralysis, like the experience itself, and then what you do, what you eat, what you watch before bed, all of these different things. Um, 
You can sleep with a night light on or wear an eye mask. That can sometimes help because if you do see something, you can just tell yourself like it's not actually my room because I can't see my room right now. Mm. Um, and also some people said um, if they've cut out gluten or dairy or sugar, alcohol, caffeine, those tend to be the things that seem to really help as well, which is really interesting. Um, talking to people that have sleep paralysis too, um, it can just kind of, it can be very cathartic because not everyone has it and everyone's gonna understand, um, like, you know, your doctor. Um, also like reclaiming our night because there's kind of a phenomena of we're so, we're meant to be productive during the day. We're so busy during the day that it's almost like a revenge um, relaxation or distraction in the evening where we, we want to reclaim some time for ourselves. And that's usually done with like alcohol or watching films or just scrolling on your phone or something. So reclaim your night in a, a kind of a more positive way, like um, no screen time before bed, the, the last hour or two um maybe you read a book under a, a warm soft light listen to music listen to an audio book something that's like a fiction that doesn't get your mind kind of curious about things or um, something that's very comforting and um what else yeah if you don't have a pet maybe get a pet <laughs> as well mm -hmm. uh, reducing any stress and also reducing nap times in the daytime um, and then what also helps some people is to try and tire the mind out uh, at night before bed either with like with a book or with with a puzzle or something like that um, and yeah I think that's about it and no exercising right before bed too I do think that Lily like it sounds like because you're going through this um therapy experience at the moment that actually nightmares are a really great opportunity to integrate that therapeutic work and it's probably a good sign you know I think that a lot of people that I speak to that come to my workshops smoke uh, cannabis because it suppresses REM sleep and they have a lot of experience of nightmares arising because they're suppressing trauma mm -hmm. and so actually i think nightmares are probably the most valuable tool you can have for uh transforming mm -hmm. trauma and transforming those negative experiences and integrating and evolving and growing from them and actually if you could um be lucid more often that mm -hmm. would be like the perfect opportunity and actually having the sleep ex um paralysis experience is really a taste of lucidity like there is that is a bit of lucidity there so you could use that to integrate it and one of the things i would say about integrating anything that's terrifying when you're dreaming like everything's coming from you so nothing should be actually terrifying and you can love every single thing no matter how terrifying it is and in the act of loving something you transmute it and this kind of inner alchemy occurs where you you properly integrate and change the bad things that have happened in your life and a lot of people when they have nightmares like i talk about it a lot with lucid dreaming is most lucid dreaming starts for children from having nightmares and often mm -hmm. they become lucid just to wake themselves up from a dream because they're scared but actually if you learn to not be scared of the nightmare things you can then expand that experience of lucidity and what i find with scary things appearing in dreams is that the more mental energy you give something the more power it has to overwhelm you which is why i think a lot of people have these very very mm. impressive sleep paralysis experiences so if you can think about the fact that even the most terrifying aspect of your dream is actually just an extension of yourself and you love yourself you don't hate yourself you you should love it so even something absolutely horrifying if you can become aware of it in that moment and love it it will change and you'll see it physically change into something mm -hmm. lovely and then you won't you probably won't have those dreams again mm -hmm. i've also heard that um like look if you see a sleep paralysis entity in your room if you try and look through it that can sometimes change the experience too but i just had a thought so if you're doing that therapy so that um th that involves like kind of moving your eyes is that right yeah I've, i yeah. do like tapping so just on either side so yes okay. so when you when you're um 
when you're processing she she makes me tap really fast like that oh, okay. and then Could when I... yeah, yeah. No, but sorry, I think it yeah, but it can be I think that's because it's probably over zoom but I've, when I've done it in person it's been it's been I it's been uh she's yeah, had like a little yeah. bell <laughs> on each side <laughs> that's, that's really I nice. wonder because I actually use that kind of technique to get into um out of body experiences and I wonder if you try that with your eyes while you get uh sleep paralysis mm. and see yeah. what happens because maybe that could trigger that could trigger like um lucid dreams I don't know it's just like a thought yeah. so yeah. you, you can be the guinea pig and tell yeah. us yeah <laughs> I'll let you know yeah, yeah. Can, yeah. can I ask um if you, know, you mentioned that it all comes from you, the, it was, it was it Sarah said, um, um, what, what if you um, happen to hold slightly different beliefs that you might say a small percentage uh, of dreams come from beyond yourself? Um, I mean, it, you know, if someone holds those kind of beliefs, um, which a lot of people do, um, even, even Sigmund Freud said that 5% of dreams are of a cult in origin mm, so, okay. um, well that's the example samantha gave of uh places where they do believe the cultural phenomenon is coming from with you know yeah. beyond them but i think saying that everything comes from you isn't necessarily saying that there's nothing beyond your experience but i do believe that everything is uh connected and therefore you have influence even in the greater sphere and you can decide what experiences you have based upon the belief system that you create for yourself. And so, especially when it comes to healing those kinds of issues, I've, I've had a lot of experiences of uh, encountering something negative or scary in a dream and making that decision to love it and making that decision to not be afraid of it and it changing. Mm -hmm. And that could, that's been a really powerful experience for me. And it stopped mm -hmm. me from having those similar nightmares. When I was a kid, I had a lot of dreams of being chased. And I think a lot of children do have that dream. And mm -hmm. I would be chased by a variety of different things from like the Grim Reaper to the Transformers. And um, I eventually had a dream where I realized that whoever was chasing me was something to do with me because it always knew where my hiding place was. And when I was eventually found, I just decided not to be scared of the thing and it it changed and transformed so mm. i think that your belief system has a huge impact on your dream content because dreams mm. are culturally specific for the most part as far as it i'm totally does. And your, yeah your interpretation of it does like in the, the Hmong community in america um where they really believed it and it, it made them more and more anxious and then you know it, it exacerbated their heart conditions and led to their death so that you know it, it that's not really helpful however um i so brenda moore wrote a really good book called 40 winks about her experience with sleep paralysis as a narcoleptic and she's also a sleep technician so it's a really interesting book but she actually says because there's this kind of popular thing with lucid dreaming with shadow work and embracing any kind of nightmare content um but she said that she actually had a really bad experience with that she felt like it wasn't like psychologically good for her that she was actually inviting kind of a dark something dark whether it was something within her or not that's not always like you know and and i think sometimes uh these different experiences can have different affordances like dreams lucid dreams non-rem or rem dreams sleep paralysis obes they can all be slightly different so um like definitely for obes um I don't know. I've just heard so many stories and I've had my own experiences with OBEs with like theoretical OBEs um, that I do. I'm like very, very much on the fence with, mm. I'm not going to make any assumptions about, um, you know, the reality of it. Well, if you believe in a collective unconscious, which I do, I think that other things from, yeah. you know, the, the collective unconscious can get into you, but you, st I think you still yeah. have the autonomy mm. to transform it from your yeah. point of view yeah and that's what i'm find, i find really fascinating is that you know there's the collective unconscious but then there's also you know storytelling and the fact that there are just some stories that we all hear and i think that's kind of what my comment was about was this idea that you know like around the world then we all have had local stories and that 
typically when people have sleep paralysis, it is like a sort of like local monster or ghost or, or whatever. But like yeah. now that there are stories that are, you know, so widely shared and now we all have the internet and can access like any film, like how is that mm. completely changing? Like, I, think the that's, experience? I think that's a really important point. I think that um, yeah. one of the issues with dream content is the fact that we can't ever be fully conscious of every single piece of information or data we've absorbed. And we may be manifesting mm -hmm. a creature out of a story that our parents read to us when we were five years old. We just don't know. And actually memory has a really important part to play in lucid dreaming in particular, because I think that lucid dreaming mm -hmm. is something to do with uh, complex memory uh, capabilities, I guess. And um, I think that, we can't ever be sure where some, you know, there's a lot of dreams that I have where I'm like, oh, I know where that came from and I know where that came from, but I don't necessarily think that things that I can't identify the root are necessarily supernatural. Mm. I think that the, in most yeah. cases, it is something that I've seen, not during the day, but during my entire lifetime, which is an inordinate amount of information and archetypal forms and pictures, images, texts, everything. Yeah, the archetypal form is really interesting. So that's kind of one of the things that um, David Hufford, who's like one of the main anthropologists who talks about sleep paralysis, that's one of his arguments is that um, anthropology has tended to look at any kind of spiritual experience, including sleep paralysis, as resulting from culture. So you experience what you're taught somehow. And he actually, he did a study in Newfoundland where there was tons of people having sleep paralysis that didn't even know what it was. And they, they didn't know what they were seeing. But across cultures, these it's like almost like there's an archetype of there tends to be there's a lot of like long, thin, um, like nails or hair or fingers. Um, the eyes are what's most commented on in terms of body parts. Um, there's like old, like an old woman or a shadow person or there's all these different archetypes or like a little person. And, um, so so from that, he started his experiential source hypothesis that these you know at least some of these spiritual experiences come from or beliefs sorry come from experiences and not the other way around but then culture does have a role to play and so does genetics like there's just so many factors that um so it's kind of looking at an individual's sleep paralysis or sleep paralysis occurring in an epidemic in a, in a community it's like it's kind of like detective work because there's so many different um, areas to look at that can impact it. Humans do have a tendency to create human faces and human humanoid forms out of yeah. Uh, yeah. phenomena as well. And it's, it's one thing he also said is that it's interesting that it's mostly a kind of social threat, like a humanoid threat or mm. a supernatural creature rather than, I think I've only heard of one case of, an environmental threat like a fire in the house or something like that but that's also a really interesting thing but there's the social uh, st simulation hypothesis or social simulation theory um, of dreams that our dreams uh, prioritize social content at least in REM sleep so that could also be the case for sleep paralysis maybe mm. Yeah, I was surprised once I have, I've only had, well, I once had sleep paralysis about a snake, which I thought was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And I also like wasn't paralyzed in that moment either. So I could like feel them and was moving as well. But I think that was because mm -hmm. I needed to step on a deadly snake that day. So it was <laughs> oh, okay. that's interesting. So it is like, you know, dream content, uh, day residues coming up in your sleep paralysis. Yeah, definitely. But I was wondering how common, yeah, I was, I was curious at how common that was because I assumed that for most people it was, yeah, social and about people. So that's interesting to hear. Oh, like that. animals and things like that? Mm -hmm. um, or fires or things that just yeah, are not. I mean, I've, I've heard of um, like spiders and stuff, but, but yeah, it's very, very uncommon. I don't think I've ever heard of um, a snake, but somebody told me, so I was talking to someone whose cabin crew up until a couple of years ago. And she told me that her and her colleagues just constantly got sleep paralysis in hotels around the world, but also while they were flying on the plane when they were sleeping because of their shift work. Um, so, I, I mean, I can't even imagine like having sleep paralysis on a plane as well, and especially seeing something as well on a plane. 
it's like that somebody should make a movie out of that um but she said she was in a hotel in indonesia and um she she had her eyes closed she had sleep paralysis but she felt like a face there like she felt the presence and she felt like kind of brushing against her um, and then she came out of it and she noticed there was a, a canopy on the bed because there's insects and stuff there. She noticed there was little loose lizards crawling around. So it's almost like um, her, she heard the scuttering, but her mind created a face instead. Um, which, yeah, actually that reminds me of a, a really spooky story that a friend of mine had. Um, so he was a Korean student in London. And he had a lot of sleep paralysis. He also had a lot of um, kind of psychic experiences and so did his mom. So I think there's a genetic thing there as well. But so this took place in London. He was sleeping and he had sleep paralysis and he saw a man like parallel to him, just hovering above him like this. Um, so his face was like right in his face, but it was actually a Korean guy as well. Um, even though it took place in London, and he was just like smiling right in his face, and he actually saw this. Um, so yeah, like this, it it can just be so um, terrifying for people. So I think it's. Uh, it's I've, really noticed, too. I've noticed that those kind of waking hallucinations, and we were talking uh, before we went live about actually the ability to hallucinate or the phenomenon of hallucinating isn't really reserved for like madness it really is quite a common human mm. phenomenon that perhaps we just don't uh exercise as much anymore because like you say there's a stigma around mental health hallucinating and also yeah. we're so distracted and looking at stuff all the time that we aren't conjuring out of our imaginations uh visuals generally speaking but i've had quite a few experiences that i would say were probably tied in with sleep deprivation and uh for example when i was in thailand lying on the beach i was kind of like uh, i don't know if my eyes would have been open or closed but um i was in this kind of like limbo state and i just constantly saw these like faces swooping in front of me absolutely like photographically perfect mm. detailed faces and if ever i do have periods of that kind of waking hypnagogia that's generally what mm. i see these faces swooping in front of my face and they mm. won't be people i recognize but they'll be like perfectly articulated like really, yeah. really detailed photogra photographic images of people and i think that that does come from the human mind's ability to conjure up faces out of yeah. nothing. what's it called parody yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah like you see faces in um, in the clouds or whatever yeah yeah it's, it's like we're always looking for faces we're social creatures and it's really hardwired mm. but, but it also begs the question you know um when we say the mind does that um you know what wh what are we talking about what is the mind anyway? Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, we could, you could argue a different version where the mind is encountering yeah. something of something beyond that. And, you know, I mean, it's mm -hmm. not unreasonable depending mm -hmm. on your, your theory of mind in, in philosophy of mind. If you, if you're not mm -hmm. a materialist, that is, yeah, I'm not particularly a materialist. It's just a, an easy way, I guess, of expressing it. But I think of the, I think of the human organism as being a receptor for the rest of the universe, and that's kind of how I interpret it. Mm -hmm. I've had. I'm. I, hi. Hello. Hello. Um, hi, I'm Liz. Um, I've had sleep paralysis sort of on and off since I was a kid, and it's kind of changed. Um, and of course, mostly it's kind of scary, but I've been trying to transform it into something else. It's quite hard when you're in it. But I used to, I, I used to see things, but it, I wrote it in the chat actually when Sarah was saying about cultural sort of, you know, think, oh, there are things that tie images in different cultures. And I used to see the kind of green goblin-y figure when I was a kid at the end of my bed. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't always, but then, I couldn't ever think of a reference. I mean, I might have seen it somewhere that I'd seen that before, um, mm -hmm. or it was something I was scared of in real life. It was kind of weird. Mm -hmm. But then when I was older and I looked it up, because I never told anyone about my sleep paralysis. I just kept it. Yeah. I think it's probably quite common. Like you mentioned the thing of mental health, where you just think it's a dream yeah. that happened to me. Um, and then I found that image was in, you know, it was quite a common image. Um, 
in the kind of Western culture that dates back several centuries. Yeah. Um, mm. So it's kind of interesting. But now my sleep paralysis is, uh, when I do get it, and I don't get it so often, um, is, it's been really scary. It's been kind of about being, it's always, a, I'm in an identical room I'm in. It's always when I fall asleep. Yeah. It's the moment of falling asleep. And the room is totally identical, but there's a presence or it's something on me or I can feel it or it's sort of, you know, it's mm -hmm. something feels very strong. So um, that's, that's how it's kind of transformed um, over the mm -hmm. years. But it's, uh, yeah, but it's always in a room. It's totally identical. So the yeah. So yeah, and that's that's a really good point too because I noticed. So there was always this question of like you feel like your eyes are open, right? Yeah. And there's always I always had a question of are my eyes actually open because sometimes there doesn't seem to be a, like a I don't feel like my eyes are opening as I wake up sometimes. Right. But, um, but if you when you talk about I have to shake myself physically out of the state. Yeah. Um, so I don't feel, it's hard to know whether I feel I'm waking up out of something because I'm in the same mm. space, always. Mm. I'm always in the room. I can see everything around me. It's the same. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I had one sleep paralysis experience like that where um, I saw a bookcase in my room, which wasn't actually there. It was a huge bookcase. And I actually saw a man like kneeling on my bed and his head was down so I couldn't see his face. And he had this like brown patches of hair and there was like little tufts missing. And this, his shirt he was wearing was um, white, but it had like, like a skeleton, it was like a skeleton shirt. So where his bones would be were in light blue. And um, I managed to kind of get myself out of that by wiggling my pinky finger. And then I noticed in my sleep paralysis experience, I thought I was on my back. But when I woke up like properly, I was actually kind of half on my side. Mm -hmm. And right in front of me was um, a pillow, and from up close, I could see that it was brown, and there were little tufts of fibers missing. And then over a bit further, there was a blue um, pillowcase with, which was white with blue uh, ivy on it. And then where I saw the bookcase, there was actually that was um, the same sort of size and shape as the sunlight coming in through the door. So, and it was amazing because I saw these things with such detail as a man in a bookcase. I could see the books on the shelf. So I think it's, it's interesting. Like I think in sleep paralysis, our eyes might be just open just enough to kind of get input and- Great point. One, yeah, one of the things that I've had problems with is kind of finding a, a clear answer about when exactly in the sleep cycle um, sleep paralysis occurs. Maybe somebody like, in that, that's here um, can explain it a bit more to me because I'm not a neuroscientist or sleep scientist. Um, and so I spoke to my friend Rodrigo Montenegro recently who is studying these things and he said it, it always depends. Like I found papers saying that it, it occurred in non-REM sleep which would make sense because in non-REM sleep you are processing sensory information from the environment more than in REM sleep you're more like cut off and you're more in a immersive dream um, but it just seems sleep paralysis seems to just have um, kind of a combination of characteristics from different parts of the sleep cycle and one of the things that I want to look into now actually is if there's a difference between sleep paralysis experiences in the beginning of the night and at the end of the night. Mm, I've, I, my sleep my only sleep paralysis experiences um, have been trying to wake up out of a dream and not being able to wake up out of a dream. But what you say about mm -hmm. um, potentially people's eyes being open during sleep process is fascinating because a lot of people do actually sleep with their eyes open. And it would be yeah. interesting to see if that correlates with episodes of sleep paralysis. Yeah. I've and I was wondering if there's been too. much research done about that. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I was just curious about like on, on the subject of, of sleeping with your eyes open if I know there's been lots of research around how things like virtual reality can improve lucid dreaming or that it's like an interesting space for practicing that but is there any research about the connection between um, using things like virtual reality or designing VR experiences about sleep paralysis that has influenced people's experience at all? Um, that's actually something I'm looking into as well, is generally like how technology is um, 
so I think definitely like people do see uh, technology in, in their sleep paralysis experiences. So I think it is kind of like that dream content leaking over. And, and then again, like I said, like, I don't think our mind, we're very adaptive and I don't, I think because we're so adaptive, we just take in so much, we take things for granted. Um, so if we spend more time in virtual reality, we're probably gonna, I think a lot of our experiences are gonna change um, in the future, for sure. But um, just to go back, um, so when we were mentioning about um, like trying to make the sleep paralysis experience more positive, um, and a lot of people can go from sleep paralysis to a lucid dream or out of body experience, which is it's very um, empowering and very it can be very pleasant. And um, so I've, I've, there's a lot of techniques online. Like I have done it, but only accidentally. So I'm not gonna. I don't know if I can, you know, share these these techniques, but there's a lot of them online. And um, uh, Ryan Hurd came out with a book on sleep paralysis about a month or two ago. And he, I think he has like one or two chapters dedicated to how to make your sleep paralysis uh, into a more pleasant yeah. experience. Because people that do, they, they end up loving sleep paralysis. Because yeah. that's what I want, I'd love to do. So it'd be really interesting getting those um, references. Um, yeah, I'll uh, make a list and then we can put it right. down for it. You, Liz, have you experimented with things like the vibrational state? Do you, or do you have anything like, um, do you get that it, like popping sound ever that people talk about? Because no. in terms of like trying to get uh, out of body experiences, there's a lot of talk about trying to encourage essentially sleep paralysis and working with the vibrational state. So you are, if you like, kind of directing your experience of sleep paralysis. Yeah, and that's what I'm sort of trying to look into at the moment. It's kind of interesting, you know, it's funny people on the call I know talking about sort of psychic phenomena. And I, I'm, you know, it's interesting talking to people who, ha who are sort of like, who are mediums, who talk about what sleep paralysis is for them, you know, how they interpret it. Um, mm. I have had, I've had a re one, apart from it, obviously it's pretty frightening, <laughs> sleep paralysis. Yeah. I mean, I, I, all my experiences have been frightening, apart from one I had recently. Um, but I have had really bizarre, I had the weirdest, and you know, you were talking about the hotel, the most yeah. horrible experience, yeah. one of the most experience I've ever had, and I, I, before lockdown, I used to travel a lot, um, was a hotel in Rotterdam, which is, because I didn't know anything about, and I'm not, I'm not someone who wants to sort of mess with psychic phenomena because I've always been very scared of it. Um, mm. If I had a terrifying sleep paralysis um, moment in a room um, and I found out later a friend of mine had exactly the same and then there's a real history with the hotel um, mm. and I don't want to think about this hotel because I travel a lot so it's not something I want to kind of mess mm. with but it's, uh, it's an infamous hotel in Rotterdam mm. that used to be a Nazi interrogation centre and it was one bit of it got um, oh gosh! It wasn't bomb, but it was fun. when I, I got put in the same hotel the next year. I was at a film festival there, mm. and I, it changed names. So I thought, great, I don't need to mention it to anybody because I thought they were sending me. To, it was an invitation to another hotel, and I asked the staff in the end. I was in a different bit of the hotel, and when the manager mm. went away, he said, "Yeah, it's so it's weird." I have been in situations where. And it was a friend of mine, a Canadian friend of mine. She left the festival. She was so freaked out. And when we met each other for a couple of months, she told me the same night, because I saw her and she was totally bizarre because I was terrified mm. and I went out to breakfast early. She kind of ignored me and she left town. So we had sleep paralysis and the same experience on the same night. Wow. Mm. I, well, I've heard some things like that. It's, it's yeah. like that fascinates me. It's amazing. I think that. Yeah, it's, it's like what you were saying, Sarah, about maybe it's the kind of collective consciousness thing or, um, or like what Don was saying too. I mean, we don't really know. We don't really know, but I'm fascinated with, about these um, particular experiences. Wh which hotel was it? I, I was in Rotterdam uh, last oh, year. NH, <laughs> I haven't been for a while. It was <laughs> NH Atlanta. <laughs> NH Atlanta, it used to be the Golden Tulip and they changed the name in between the years. That's why I thought, oh, oh, they're, not, they're not sending me... But I've heard other stories about the hotel, a friend of mine who'd been on sheets to Rotterdam. So it's kind of, you know, it's, a, it's mm -hmm. you know, how can you, it's a very bizarre when there are sort of things that collectively happen to people. 
Yeah, I was actually told a story about, um, so this is from the same class, mm. air stewardess that I spoke to. Um, so she went to Osaka, Japan, and she, she was in the same hotel room with another air stewardess. And the other one had had sleep paralysis in this hotel, which was apparently, um, you know, infamously haunted. And um, she, so she had sleep paralysis and she just felt something in the room and she could see like everything in her room kind of shaking and bouncing up and down like a poltergeist attack or something. And um, so I think, I think at first she thought it was an earthquake because it was in Japan, but nothing was falling down like it should have. Um, and then, um, uh, so I guess it was in another room. Um, the person I was talking to just woke up and had a really strange feeling and she just didn't feel right in the room. And then she looked behind the TV and her bed and the uh, painting on the wall and she found amulets pasted behind all of those places. Um, so she said, if you ever find amulets in the hotel, um, it means it's haunted. And she was adamant about that. And even though if, if you find amulets in a, you know, in a place, like I'm in an Airbnb place right now here in Korea, and there are amulets in the broom cupboard. Um, and because she told me that it has a connection with a haunted place, I was like, oh my God, this place is haunted. And then she told me, no, it was, uh, her mom put it there to, um, to kind of make sure that they don't get any weird tenants in the Airbnb. I was like, yeah, well, it didn't work because I'm... Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, Korean ghost stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, so you know, the extraordinary, um, you know, moments. And it's funny because I only started talking about this until I met, actually, Sarah and I know each other from working in virtual reality. And it was a project that I curated for a film festival I curate. And it was a Danish guy, it was a few years ago, who did a project that emulates sleep paralysis. It's kind of scary. Um, oh. and luckily, my a colleague told me about it before, and so I was ready for it. But it was funny, we had a conversation. It was the first time I started talk. I never really mentioned it to anyone. You know, that was only three years ago. Oh, wow. <laughs> so before then, you thought that we were, like, other people didn't experience it. You didn't know what yeah. it was. Oh, wow. Well. Reality is very promising in terms of uh, lucid dreaming and sleep paralysis and things like that because mm. one of the my areas of interest is the way that you actually look at dreams and the way you see dreams. Obviously, you've got your eyes closed. It's an imaginative realm, but you look into the dream space in a particular way, and it's a particular way that we don't exercise very often in our waking reality anymore, especially with the advent of screens and technology. We're often looking at flat surfaces, and mm. I think natural vision is looking into spaces and looking into uh, three dimensional space. So virtual reality will be a return to that, even though it's technological, it'll be a return to looking through and into space at three dimensional objects. Mm. And actually I, my experiences of using virtual reality is I usually have a lucid dream like that night because it's the same as looking into a lucid dream space you're looking like through mm -hmm. space. And I used to do a lot of exercises just naturally when I was a kid of looking through and into space. And I think that as a culturally we're, we're doing that less these days because of our dependence upon technology and mm -hmm. our looking at flat screens mm -hmm. and our looking at TVs and our looking at phones and devices. We're not uh, in training that method of looking at stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. Really and we're also quite linear as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a big, yeah. it, like the linear perception of time and reality basically influences your perception of reality. I totally agree with that. I think that mm -hmm. um, our, our experience of time has got increasingly linear as well. And um, mm -hmm. actually time can't possibly exist like that in reality. It's a construct of modern society to think that we live on this 24 hour clock system. But, but there's sometimes strange paradoxes. Uh, I would say one of the, I know this is terrible generalization, but one of the least linear places I found in Europe is Germany, which is supposed to be the very ordered as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, but it's just, just something about how people congregate and how they walk around in England. It tends to be so A to B. Whereas my experience of Germany was that it was much more chaotic, much more, uh, yeah. Mm. There's a lot of um, lucid dream research as well that comes out of Germany. So I wonder if there's a, a connection there. Maybe yeah, that's, they have a lucid dream there. 
Ursula Voss is one of the lucid dream researchers in Germany. I think she's from, I think she was uh, researching lucid dreaming in Frankfurt and she was quite cynical about lucid dreaming, but they did a study using uh, TMS, I think, on the frontal cortex to see if they could like zap someone into lucidity during REM sleep. And that was quite interesting because that was, um, that kind of showed that because you have, during lucid dreaming, your frontal cortex is activated, which enables you to like self-reflect whilst dreaming so if mm. you uh create a uh coherent um harmonic frequency or frequency that influences that frontal part of your dream and you're in you're taking people that aren't even lucid dreamers but they're in an rem state and zapping them with it at that moment that they have rem they'll suddenly wake up into lucid dreaming which mm. i think is amazing and there was a crowd funder for um what was it called the aladdin hair headband that was was aiming to do that like as a home device imagine dapping yourself into a lucid dream and then recording what you say yeah as well. yeah i mean i wonder my dream when i was a kid was inventing a dream recording machine and there are i think there was a japanese te team i can't remember the name of the person that did it but mm. they were basically they hooked people up to hours and hours and hours of youtube footage analyzing their brain mm. waves and and quite complex eeg signals and um then when they were asleep they were hooked up to the same measuring equipment and so what they were able to do was um match the youtube nature of the footage that are being shown at any particular time with the brainwave signals and frequencies and they created mm -hmm. this kind of dream landscape out of creating a composite image from those youtube um, videos and it's an amazing thing to watch because you kind of see basically when someone's dreaming about someone talking to them you see a newsreader talking head and it's all kind of blurry and it doesn't it's obviously not like um what a dream looks like but it has something about the kind of dream timing and dream feel and dream flow and dream morphology which actually does feel mm -hmm. very dreamlike so in the future i think there's going to be um lucid dream uh film directors probably like really yeah. good lucid dreamers but i hope so, so. I've had so much, and i wonder too about you know is it going to work the same for obes and sleep paralysis right I think um, it's probably going to be tech that can give people those experiences. There's already virtual reality tech for giving you an out of body experience and that's incredibly easy to hack actually. So mm -hmm. that could be quite interesting. And I know there's virtual reality devices for or virtual reality experiences of seeing loved ones that have died as well to give you that personal experience. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. which is, it's got such a sort of tragic element to it, but I do think um, almost accidentally we're going to, create this new wave of lucid dream experiences through virtual reality i think it's quite promising for that yeah. interesting things ahead i think especially now that it's easier to integrate things like biofeedback and the yeah. idea that you can control an yeah. experience in your body as well yeah i work on a breath controlled <laughs> vr experience and help people manage anxiety and i think it's like really interesting just to see the the more mm. possibilities that you can unlock through things like heart rate and galvanic in response and i think virtual reality could be mm -hmm. something to use for uh awake induced lucid dream wild technique so basically you'd be in lucid you'd be in virtual reality and it would take you through that threshold into the dream i think that that's a possibility mm -hmm. that could be quite easy to do i guess uh, we should probably wrap up about now thank you so much to everyone for coming is there any last thoughts that you want to share samantha um oh yes so as the, like I was saying before, there's a social dream matrix where um, people share their dreams and, uh, or did I talk about this before? I don't remember. No, you, just you just told me. Oh, yeah. Okay. No. So there's a social dream matrix. Um, it's like a method of um, sharing dreams. And I'm really interested in applying that to sleep paralysis. So people would um, talk about a recent sleep paralysis experience and then somebody else would share another, a similar sleep paralysis experience with a, a similar theme and and so on and so forth and we could find patterns in that um so i have a an event coming up on january 3rd on sunday which is also 11 o'clock in the morning in the uk i hope that's not too early for people but if anyone wants to join um then they're more than welcome to brilliant thank you so much and thank you to everyone for coming along as well and um I hope that you all have very excellent dreams this evening.
Thanks so much, Samantha. Thank you so much. Okay, bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.